we were getting a lead every few seconds. If you're thinking about it from just like a pure growth perspective, we didn't optimize your conversion, but we did optimize it for growth, right? And I think that's kind of the mistake that a lot of growth projects make, which is they're not looking at the entire funnel. The conversion is probably lower, but like the amount of impressions and the amount of attention got is a thousand X higher than it otherwise would have been. And the overall results were way better. And so sub-optimizing for like a portion of the funnel is like a classic growth mistake. And like we try to not do that. And I think that's probably the biggest lesson is that this idea of best practices, we follow no best practices. I got an email last night saying, this is everything you're doing wrong in terms of B2B best practices on your website. And here's how you should change it. And I said, thank you very much. But we did this very intentionally because best practice means the same as everyone else. But on a meta level, if you do the same thing as everyone else, you're going to get the same results. Welcome to The Peel, where we explore the world's greatest startup stories. I'm your host, Turner Novak, founder of Planned Capital, the only venture capital firm that consistently goes viral. Today, we're sitting down with my friend Siki Chen, co-founder and CEO of Runway, the finance platform revolutionizing the $80 trillion business industry. A few months ago, Runway's new website went viral across the internet, and Siki takes us inside how that happened. He's no stranger to going viral, having previously built multiple companies that went from zero to millions of users within weeks, including the fastest growing product ever before ChatGPT took the crown in late 2022. Siki also shares his thoughts on making enterprise products more consumery, how to tell a story, his fundraising secrets, and all his tactics on hiring and building teams. Before we get going, a shout out to Lenny Rachitsky, Neve Drawer, Kevin Lee, Pradeep, and Arjun Sethi for suggesting some great questions for Siki. I think you're going to learn a lot, so let's jump in after a quick word from Atio. There's a world where your CRM is powerful, easily configured, and deeply intuitive. Atio makes it a reality. Atio is a CRM built specifically for today's modern company. It's flexible, easily configures to your unique data structures, and works for any go-to-market motion from self-serve to sales-led. It automatically enriches your contacts, syncs your emails and calendar, lets you create powerful reports, and quickly build Zapier-style automations. The next era of companies deserves more than a one-size-fits-all CRM with outdated UX. Someone recently described Atios to me as the linear of CRMs, which that is very high praise. Join OpenAI, Replicate, Eleven Labs, and more. Try Atio instantly at atio.com, that's A-T-T-I-O.com, or tap the link in the show notes and scale your company to the next level. Siki, how's it going? Welcome to the show. It's going great. It's good to see you, Turner. So I wanted to really quick hit on first. I think it was a couple months ago, you redesigned the website for Runway and it went viral. Like I remember, I think we are in at least one group chat together, other group chats I'm in. I think I was really busy that day and I just kept seeing it popping up on my phone and I was like, what is going on? I was like seeing it and all like, well, I was like in between Zooms, like, what is this? And I looked and like the website like took over the internet, basically. What happened that day? Yeah, it was nuts internally, but we released this new website and we were working on it between that and branding work for about six months. And I just wanted to get it out there and get some feedback on it, you know, and it was, I think, a Saturday and we had it up and we just pointed the DNS to it. And I said, hey, we got some new jobs. Oh, we wanted to hire some people, had some new roles and a new website. Check it out. And it just exploded. That's what happened. So why do you think it happened? Yeah, it actually exceeded our expectations wildly. It was something that we were hoping to happen. During the development design process, the thing we kept on thinking about is how do we do something that that tells the story of what runway is, but pushes like what it, people think good design is in the space of B2B forward. Uh, and it's built for not just conversion, actually not at all for conversion, but for uh, interest, like surprise and entertainment. And so all of that crystallized into something that was fresh and new. And so, you know, what we, this is actually tied to what we think our mission is a runway, right? So when we look at what we're building, we're building this finance platform, but finance platform people don't like using not even finance people. And the real end goal of this is to make this accessible to everyone else in the company too, not just finance people. 
Uh, we think that has like very deep impact and meaning around there. And in order to do so, we want the website to reflect that. And so what does it take to achieve that mission? It has to be like a product that you can see and something that is approachable. And the vibe is like, this is not professional software. It's a relatable. We talk to you like a human. And so those are some of the thought that went into the design. But I think the other thing is like, what 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 is the opposite of a B2B website? right? It's like stock photos, you don't show the products. Let's just do the opposite and see what happens. And people have been hungering for something different. And I think that's probably the biggest lesson is that this idea of best practices, like we follow no best practices. I got an email last night from a woman who wrote a loon saying, this is like everything you're doing wrong in terms of B2B best practices on your website. And here's how you should change it. And I said, thank you very much. But like, we did this very intentionally because best practice means the same as everyone else. And from on a meta level, if you do the same thing as everyone else, you're going to get the same results. One really interesting point that you hit on was it was not optimized for conversions. And I don't think it's live yet, right? Like it just says get access. Like you can't even really like convert and start using it yet. So it wasn't really like you're trying to, I mean, you were just like you said, put it out there, hire some people. Like, how did it go? we were getting a lead like every few seconds. Okay. Wow. Just the Slack was just going crazy. Like, so we have some internal AI tools and one of the things we built is automatic lead qualification. So anytime someone would come in, enter their email, we would clear bid it. So we have some more information on what it does, what the real world person is. And then we have like very specific criteria on whether their leads qualified that the uh, AI tool would explain in plain English language. Like this company, because they're that size and this role, this is why they're qualified. And that thing was just painting every few seconds when it went, went off, which is pretty wild. But I think like one of the things, if you're thinking about it from just like a pure growth perspective, we didn't optimize your conversion, but we did optimize it for growth, right? And I think that's kind of the mistake that a lot of like growth projects make, which is they're not looking at the entire funnel, right? The conversion is probably lower, but like the amount of impressions and the amount of attention got is like a thousand X higher than it otherwise would have been. And the overall results were way better. And so like sub-optimizing for like a portion of the funnel is like a classic growth mistake. And like we try to not do that. Yeah. Because it kind of it reminds me of when you think about if part of the point was just hire some people, let's say, I mean, before this experiment, for the website, no one knows what runway is. You're trying to hire people. I mean, it's its own set of challenges, but let's just say 10 million people saw the website. I don't know what the number was, but basically like your entire pool of candidates and people in our world all saw the website and they're like, holy shit, that's, this website is amazing. This is, looks like a good product. Then when someone's interviewing or getting recruited at runway, they can tell their friends and their friends like, oh, that's cool. I know that website. That seems like a good product. So Technically, yeah, like you had a, this leaky bucket on conversion, but that wasn't even the point really yet. It was just awareness, knowing it exists. That's really important because this connects to some experience of how to Zynga too. And some of the most important things in business and product is either difficult to measure or it takes a long time to measure. And so, you know, if you're, for example, optimizing for direct response conversion, right? You're looking, how many clicks did you get? How many people signed up? But you know, what we're trying to get to do is our buyer may want to think about this like once or twice a year. And our goal needs to be that when they do that, they think runway is in the mix because we have a lot of confidence that if they just talk to us and look at us, they will end up buying us. So we just need to be more aware of us. uh, And that requires something different too. So I think like thinking holistically and having the freedom to think about things more in terms of the long-term results, it's kind of underrated in growth in general. Yeah. I, I remember you had a really interesting comment in one of the groups that we're in. I think you remember saying like, I specifically like all the, all these like B2B websites look the same. And I mean, I've seen that comment from people, like I think probably linear is the example, like everyone copied their website design. And so, and it's, you think it's essentially a function of, you know, quote unquote, best practices. So people, something becomes a best practice and everyone just copies it. And then it's, there's no differentiation. It's not really a best practice anymore. It's hard 
and it's expensive in time and it takes some courage to do something new. And I think like linear, there's a reason why people copied it because it was new and it was amazing when it came out. And that's why it made such an impact. And you're not going to get the same results if you do that. That's not how it works, right? We got relatively similar results. People, you know, go to different firms. Like I've heard multiple stories like, and you know, the, the agency would say, what do you want? They're like, we want runway. <laughs> no way. That's awesome. It's happened like, a, I've heard of the multiple times. And I have like dozens of people asking me, which firm do you use? Like, I, I want that same thing. Like, we didn't get there because we used one firm. They're a great firm, by the way. It's called Reform Collective. We work with them at Sandbox. But we work with them really closely. It's like, here's like, the vibe. And like, here's why it needs to be different. And here's how we're different. And so if you want the same results, like, you can't just say, we want that. You're not going to get the same thing. Well, and I think it kind of comes back to a question from a mutual friend, Pradeep. He said, should enterprise be more consumery? And and then how do you do that? Like, how do you be consumery in enterprise? I think it's happening in pockets here. And, you know, in terms of the productivity tools that people are used to using, whether that's Airtable or Figma or Notion, those are tools that clearly are consumer grade products that are assuming a many enterprise use cases in general should enterprise be more summary yeah i think that's our entire game plan and strategy for that here so the way i describe part of the opportunity for runway is you think about traditional software you you have two choices it's relatively easy and everyone wants to make something really accessible and easy to use and friendly and consumery but the problem is traditionally you have to build pretty simple products, right? It's pretty easy to make something like a text editor more consumer You just type, but it doesn't do a whole lot else, right? Or you have to build something like an enterprise resource planning platform and it has to do everything. And because it has to do everything, it's really difficult to use. It's hard to make it good, right? And I think that's kind of the trade-off here. And our observation is that in the last half a decade or so with Figma, Notion, Airtable, Coda, this generation of software. What these products have done is proven that you can actually push forward the efficient frontier of this trade-off. Things can both become more accessible and a lot more powerful than you previously thought possible. And they it was made possible because they designed the right abstractions and primitives to give the power and flexibility to the end user in a really accessible form. And this is kind of a new thing People call it no code or, or low code, but that's the way I think about it is like, yeah, you're exposing the in to the end user, the flexibility of software itself in visual form. And I think that's an enabler of this. So it's happening. The value of happening, I think is like pretty profound. The value is people like using your software and your software can be fun. And for us, those are like two really important qualities um, because when software is fun, especially in knowledge work, it makes you smarter. It makes you creative. You can explore and be curious about how the business works, what's going on in your business. And that kind of curiosity is what leads to insights. I think amplitude, you know, analytics, right? Like that's a probably the most well-known analytics platform. It had that quality. You know, you could dig in and play with your data and explore. And that's what I loved about the company. I used to be an investor in it. They're public now, yeah. Yeah, they're public now. But that's that's what great software can do if it's approachable and consumer and enterprise software traditionally isn't that. Everyone hates using it. It's just pure paperwork. I don't really know what the tipping point is, but it's kind of like I don't know, you just think of when you say the word enterprise software, I just think of this like, you know, rigid, hard to use SAP, like ERP thing, not good design. Like I think one of my internships during college, I literally had to upload PDFs into SAP. It's like, why am I uploading PDFs into SAP? Like what? Yeah, it's wild. So you have a kind of interesting journey of how you've gotten all this like consumer learning. Your, I think your very first job during college, I think, was was at NASA in the Jet Propulsion Lab, won a couple of awards. My question is, how do you get a job at NASA? Like that's, that's a big thing. It was my, my dad had a friend. I had terrible grades. I had no business being NASA. And my dad's friend owed him a favor and offered me a job. That's amazing. But then you ended up being pretty good if you won multiple awards. Yeah, that was really transformative for me. I never was like a great student. I went to like 
kind of an okay school, right? And during that job, if fell serious, we're working on the rovers, a spirit and curiosity. And I never really built anything in production before. And I've never done machine vision. And I had a really interesting project. I got to like touch the rovers and we're working on machine vision for it. And I realized that I can do this, you know, like I can pick it up. I can build something useful. And that just gave me like so much confidence. And it's one of those things where I first somewhat experienced imposter syndrome in a sense that because I was able to build this really useful thing, that it must be really easy. Anyone can do it. Right. And I was explaining to my friends, like, yeah, it's not that difficult. Like, it's just, you know, we're detecting like uh, the dots to calibrate the camera. And it's automatically, and you're like, that seems really hard. I'm like, okay. But you, that's just because you don't understand it. Right. But yeah, like the first job really changed my outlook on like, I'm not a loser. <laughs> Being fair on all this, my very first job, it was one of my really good friend's moms. She like worked, she was like the high up in this manufacturing company. I got a job in the factory. My very first job. And it was basically, you know, just met him, had a good relationship. And, you know, he was basically like hire my friend. And I think probably I was pretty, maybe I was good. But anyways, it's like, I think you usually need that. You need somebody to go and, you know, do something for you. That very first. I don't think I would be in the same place without that. I was like, definitely a short of luck. You started to get more into kind of tech and startups. How did that happen? How'd you do that? So during a school year, I was looking for a part-time job. I <laughs> applied for a job in a cafeteria and I, I lasted like literally a day. Wait, so you got the job. Did you quit or was it just like, I can't do this? Yeah, I was like, I don't like it. <laughs> so I looked at San Diego for any startups that existed. And one of the companies that was hiring was a company called Webmetrics. They did like low testing for websites and website monitoring like for response times. And my manager... My engineering manager was a person named Lenny Rachetsky, who is now the world's most famous FIA. Yep. Like the number one most well-known FIA, which is still wild to me. He was my engineering manager. He was really great. So nice. And it was a real job. And I enjoyed that too. It was just fun to code, but also spend a lot of time on user experience. And yeah, I enjoyed it. It was only one of the very few stars in San Diego is the answer. Lenny told me there's a story of, I think, in order to, like, you told them, I will only take the job if th you can beat me in horse or something, and the CEO beat you in horse, and so you end up taking the job or so something like that? I don't remember that, because I wouldn't have made that bet, because I'm not great at basketball. I think they made that bet, <laughs> that I have to take their job if I don't beat them in horse, <laughs> and I did it. I think it's reversed. <laughs> Okay, something like that. Yeah, he also, well, he said what really stood out though was it when everyone's having lunch, you'd be like reading programming books, getting better, learning, et cetera. And he said, you just like rewrote the entire code base when you joined because it all sucked. That was, those are his exact words. Yeah, I, I, I think it did suck, but it's not because like I had like a distaste for it. I just really enjoyed it. <laughs> like I wanted to be organized. You know, it was like uh, in, software engineering terms, it was a big ball of mud. The entire product was one file at a time, if I believe correctly, more or less. One giant pull script. And, you know, I wanted to like make it object oriented and have it be organized. And I just enjoy the shit out of it. You know, like wrote a bunch of unit tests and rewrote it. But the thing that he probably forgot that I'm actually more proud of is I redesigned the entire product. Okay. Maybe that's what he meant too. Uh, so we... we I did both. Um, and that was rewarding for me because like they actually were interviewing uh, design agencies, I think. And I redesigned it already. Uh, and they were like, let's just go with that one. The one that Siki did. And that was like, that made me super proud. Yeah. And then you kind of did a couple other startup jobs over the next couple of years. I think there's was VO, if I'm saying that right, power set, Le anything interesting that you learned in those roles? Uh, the thing about VO was interesting. I took down the website in production for a few hours and not knowingly and no one could figure out like what it was and it was me. And afterwards, I was made a product manager instead of an engineer, uh, which was fun. So that's how I got into product. <laughs> I got promoted because I sucked at being an engineer. <laughs> PowerSo was interesting in that I moved here for that job. San Diego up to San Francisco? 
Yeah, it was a, one of very first Ruby shops. And I'm surprised I got a job because everyone else there was like incredible. The co-founders of GitHub like were there, like Chris and Tom. And that's how we met, actually. And so yeah, feel really lucky to have gotten there. How did you think about getting those first couple of jobs when you're just right out of school? You're kind of building a, a track record per se. You're learning. Like, what did you prioritize? I would prioritize whoever wanted to hire me. I just wanted a job and I wanted to work at some kind of startup. And Webmetrics and Vio, those are like the two startups in San Diego. Um, they were willing to hire me. There weren't that many. And PowerSet just seemed interesting. They had a great brand, a great team, a mission of like building a, the next great search engine. They were trying to build basically ChatGPT or Complexity before those things existed. And this is like 16 years ago, right? The technology was far from there. I went there and yeah, the people were fantastic. And so that's probably the luckiest break I got, you know, aside from NASA, like just being able to work at PowerSet, even though I was only there for six months. <laughs> and then you started a company. Did you leave because you were starting a company? Yeah. So what happened was, so before PowerSet, I applied for YC, got turned down. I think it was spring of 07. And I moved to San Francisco for the power set job. And I somehow got in with the YC crowd and we were playing a game of diplomacy, the board game at a party. Mm-hmm. I had so much fun. And right around that time, this May of 07, the face of platform came out. I thought, well, that was a game that is fun, that is social. Maybe someone should build a version of that for Facebook. Except that was one person. I had no money. And I thought diplomacy was going to be like too tough to build for one person. So I basically built like a version of Werewolf slash Mafia for Facebook. And while I was working in PowerSet, that game blew up and I was making a couple thousand dollars a day in ad revenue. And by the way, the funny thing about that is the reason I was making a couple thousand dollars in ad revenue is because I wasn't smart enough to make an actual chat uh, interface. So it was a common interface. So while you're playing Werewolf and you want to see the chat, you had to refresh the page continuously, manually to see new messages. So new ads would pop up. Yeah, you would get paid by the impression. Like it was a wild time. At PowerSet, word got around and I was known as, my nickname was FB Mills, which is like FB Millionaire. <laughs> okay. And my co-founder, Alex, was also on a product engineering team at PowerSet and said, let's build something together. And that's what led to the first company. And then did you did you keep the mafia? I think you started a new game too once you left. That, oh, well, we were working on it in the evenings after PowerSet. And that was a new product and eventually became Friends for Sale. And the idea behind it was, it was kind of theoretical. And I was really into Facebook, the idea of the company. And at the time, one of the things they talked about is mapping the social graph of the world. It was before making the world open and connected. I think it was like even pre-newsfeed. I thought about that problem and I observed that the thing about Facebook and MySpace is that they all have the social graph, but the graph doesn't have any weights to the edges. In graph theories, you have like nodes and edges. And you can assign like numbers to the edges and the weights like in social graph terms can represent, for example, like how important is this friendship or how popular is this person, right? Like I imagine it's like probably very in demand to be friends with LeBron James, right? And how is that represented uh, in a social graph? And so I wanted to build something that would be able to assign weights to the edges of the scrap. The idea was basically, okay, how do you assign the weights? What if you had a market economy and how do one market economy work? You, could, you have the limited number of friends a person would have, and then people bid on people to become friends. And that's what led to the Friends for Sale a game. It eventually became, I didn't think of it as a game. I thought it was a social network and it was designed very much to look like a social network. But that eventually became the second largest on platform. I think we early OA, we pretty much reached everyone on Facebook. Me, it was just me and Alex part-time, and we were running a Rails cluster that was larger than Twitter in OA. Yeah, that's what Lenny told me. It was like the largest Ruby on Rails project like ever or in the world at that time. Yeah, and it was my second Rails project ever. <laughs> okay. Never administered a server, never like had to like horizontally shard a thing. And what was interesting is like a lot of the team that was a serious business eventually went to Twitter. And for example, some of the tools we build a serious business and like very few people know the story. There was a big project at Twitter where they had to migrate their master tweet database from like a 32-bit ID to a 64-bit ID because they were running out of like IDs for tweets. And they used the tools that we built at Serious Business, which was a company that 
build friends for sale to have migrate with no downtime. Like we were the first because like we had to like solve these problems first. Because you just had so much unique IDs or whatever. Okay. Yeah, you know, like two of our engineers ended up being like, you know, two out of the four most senior engineers at Twitter. And then I think you were acquired or sold to Zynga at some point. That was January of 2010, I believe. So that was about two and a half years after we were founded. So we were about 30 people. We were profitable, but, you know, Zynga was just huge. And Mark Pincus knew who, what he was doing a lot more than I did. It was a good exit. I was able to have some financial security and it was that was also a fun ride too yeah did you still run it while you're at zynga or did you start doing other products zynga acquired it and ran it for a short while then they shut it down friends for sale like this is a couple of years later and traffic was tailing off and they were just the their gains were just so much more profitable than anything that we made so we immediately started working on some new products the two products i was involved in is like one is this treasure island digging game um at a time it was actually the fastest growing product of all time so we got to 7 million daily active users in like a week or something and the next product after that alex led and i contributed to it as well i was my co-founder but that was also the fastest growing product of all time i think we got to like a tens of million like 30 million active users in like 30 days which was like was a record until ChatGPT came around wow that's crazy so what was that second one called city bill Cityville, Farmville, but you build a city. It's a Sim City plus Farmville. I'll say it. That concept just crushed it for, for Zynga. Oh my God. They were so good at what they did. And then at one point you left. You started a new company called Hey. Yeah. So two years after acquisition, I was halfway vested and I thought, all right, we're going to do the next thing. And we didn't quite know what we wanted to do. I co-founded with Alex again and we were experimenting with what is possible in mobile. And one of the things that surprised us is, wow, you can have API access to all your photos and there's background location. And what we have together is, and this is 2012. And so the photo app wasn't quite what it was today. It's just like a grid of photos. What we did is, you know, we could take your grid of photos and we can organize them and cluster them into like events. Like you're at a place, you're at a wedding, right? You took a bunch of photos uh, with the same location data. So it's like really close in time, really close in of space as well. And we can say, hey, this happened at City Hall. And you're browsing through your timeline of photos and it's just a remarkably different experience. It feels like, oh wow, this is almost like a diary and a life log. And so we combined that with a background location. And the idea was you just keep your phone in your pocket, you take photos, you're with different people, and we just like tell you everything that you did in a day. And so we worked on that for about a year and a half and then we launched it and Apple loved it. We were a global editor's choice like we're on the front page full banner in the app store like for like a couple of weeks and we got a few million downloads off of that and that was our first ios project so we're pretty happy with it and then uh, we obviously raised some money beforehand and we just couldn't find a way to make it a venture scale business but it's like effectively a private product and so it would have been an interesting lifestyle business, but the scale of mobile at the time and our ability to monetize and people willing to pay and our ability to distribution all didn't work. And so eventually we pivoted the company to a remake of Friends for Sale. But this time for Twitter and on your phone, that was the bull we had in our back pocket. It was a separate app, right? Like a new mobile app. Right. Yeah. We It was a completely different brand and it was called Stolen. And that was a bull that we had in our back pocket for when like, okay, if this main thing that we like doing is going to work, we know this thing is definitely going to work. Yeah. You got the playbook down already. Too. And from what I saw, you had like 90% day one retention, which for people who don't know what that means, I mean, that's absolutely insane. Like, I don't think I've ever seen a product have 90% day one retention. Like that basically means you download it, you leave, you come back again the next day. It, it was pretty wild. People were spending hours on it every day. Really? What, what was it? Like, what did you do again? So basically, it's the same concept as Friends for Sale, uh, what we built for, for Facebook. You get to be the one and only owner of at Justin Bieber, for example. The tag or like you own the account? A card. Uh, basically, they're, this form of trading cards. They're like, you're stealing people's cards. There's only one Justin Bieber card that's attached to the Twitter handle in existence on the app. 
and people can at any point steal it away from you if you're willing to pay like a premium over what you paid. So it was highly dynamic, right? And people would just like be like viciously trading Justin Bieber back and forth until like he's worth millions of dollars. And people actually are paying money in some capacity. But we sold a virtual currency and people spent, Jack Dorsey and Adam Bay spent like thousands of dollars personally on it. <laughs> and I think Kim Kardashian was playing it too from what I, what I saw. So it was invite only. That was the other thing. It was invite only. And uh, we gave people came in like a few invites. And within two weeks, despite it being invite only, you needed the invite code to get in. It was trending worldwide on Twitter. And what happened is, and I still have the message on Facebook. Kim Kardashian's cousin asked Drew Houston to ask me on Facebook for an invite code. And I said, here, here you go. But this 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 happened. I mean, it was similarly just like super viral. I think I saw a million daily active users or something was within a couple weeks. Well, it was only live for two, but yes. <laughs> and then what happened? And then... Zoe Quinn, who was the center of Gamer Gay at the time, was offended that she got stolen and wrote something to Catherine Clark, a congresswoman from Massachusetts. She tweeted at her, and Catherine Clark wrote an open letter to Tim Cook and Jack Dorsey saying that we open up a potential new avenue of harassment on Twitter because you can give like people a nickname. And nothing bad ever happened on Stolen, to be clear. The argument was that it could have happened. And so Jack Dorsey really liked the product. He played it a lot. He was like, yeah. And Tim Cook never played it, didn't care for it, and pulled us from the app store. And that was that. And we went from every VC reaching out to no VC responding to an email. And we ran out of money. And we were at hired six months later. Wow. Okay. Man, that sucks. Yeah, it's character building. <laughs> you know you're grinding for like three plus years like okay this is it we made it you know and it lasted for two weeks and then we did everything we could to like try to fix it and nothing worked so you acquired by postmates and then you were at postmates for a couple of years if i'm remembering right doing growth stuff yeah i was there for about a year and a half and uh, we started a proper growth team i think when i joined the we had a growth marketing team that sent marketing campaigns and there was no A-B testing. There was no like experimentation in gen. And so uh, I remember the best story I have about Postmates is when I joined, A-B testing was considered like a bad word. Like it was a very brand forward sort of company. And so no optimization, data, not important. Which is great for me, right? I was like, okay, that means there's like so many coins under the cushions here for me to just pick up. But to get there, we had to instrument and have like good data for the conversion rate and the flow. And we need to have experimentation capabilities and we didn't have any of it. And so when I joined and I was a director of product and I said, we should start a growth team. So cool. Here's like two engineers for like three months. We basically put it in instrumentation and strategy framework. And for three months, I would have to go to CEO and the CEO would ask me like, where's the growth? I said, uh, nothing's happening. We're working on things. And I was pretty sure I was going to get fired. But like once we had it in place, like the three months after, we're doing a little never like double digit, like, you know, conversion rate improvements like every week. Uh, and it got to a point where, you know, the growth team went from like two people to one point, like close to 70 people by the time I left. And so that was really fun. But that was an exercise in like working under very different cultural circumstances and trying to make something work. Interesting. Yeah. I want to give credit. Our mutual friend Kevin Lee said, we need to talk about that just like implementing growth and just doubling conversion rates. Yeah, it was a good time. It was fun. It's almost like a parallel with runway. No no metrics, not optimizing conversion. You got a little bit of an opportunity to maybe actually optimize a little bit at some point. The funny thing is experimentation went from like a bad word to basically everything that they did by the time I left was wrapped in experimentation. Okay. And the way we kind of sneakily made that happen is... I would be in a meeting and, you know, we would talk about what we did. And I said, hey, we did this. And this had a provable 25% lift in some metric. And they're like, how do you know that? Well, yeah, we, you know, when we roll something out, we try to measure what it did. And so, you know, we have this thing called a rollout framework and you're welcome to use it. And they're like, a rollout framework? That sounds great. We're going to use it when we roll something out. <laughs> <laughs> so this is just like a foreign concept. 
Yeah, and it was basically every everyone decided like A/B testing might be a good idea. Yeah, and then now it's you can't not A/B test. Like you're crazy if you're not measuring everything. Well, everyone wanted to improve the impact of what they did. So, and then after Postmates, super cool company, Sandbox VR. I think you were not a founder, but you were the CEO. I think if I'm remembering right. So I wasn't a founder. I was a very small investor in this company, I and mean, I thought it was a terrible idea. What was the idea? The idea as, as pitched to me was, have you heard about escape rooms? I said, yeah. Like, what if you had escape rooms, but in VR? I said, I've never done an escape room. I don't know, but that sounds like a really dumb idea. And then the founder said, you know, escape rooms are like a, like a $10 billion business. I said, what? And I looked it up and it was like a, somewhere around there. I'm like, what? And imagine, you know, the thing about escape rooms is you can't replay it. Imagine like you could just like swap out the digital assets and play escape rooms. And I said, okay. So what happened is this company was founded in Hong Kong, based in Hong Kong. And we were fundraising from Postmates who in Asia tour with Bastion and Kristen, who was the CFO and CEO of Postmates. So I was with them and I saw, we saw by Hong Kong and I made a stop by their first store, which apparently went viral after like they released this video. And I tried it and my mind was just, my mind was exploded. Like it was the coolest thing I've done since I used the iPhone for the first time. It was this whole deck from Star Trek, uh, but in version 0.1 form, right? So if you haven't done Sandbox, basically it's a VR experience, but you're on a real time motion capture stage with multiple people. And so you have this full body and you can high five people, you can shake their hand, you can jump up and down. And it's like you're there because you, you're not just a floating head. And that was incredible. And they have like these special effects. And that moment I was like, I got to work here. This is amazing. Like, I think I can help a lot. So I joined as chief product officer. But what happened is I had a network here, obviously, and we rebranded a company and I did most of the uh, new deck and helped with the fundraising. And when a series B came around, the CEO and founder of the board was like, hey, you know, you're doing basically like a lot of the job as CEO anyway, like maybe we should just like swap the titles and I said, okay. So uh, that happened about six months before COVID and my primary role was to get the series be done. And uh, obviously that didn't happen. Cause you were, I think you launched like the week of COVID or we're going to, or something. It was just like the worst possible timing. Yeah. We launched like a dozen stories, like the week of COVID and with intention of like you know, having a strong raise or series B, our stores were printing money. Um, and so we went from like 400 some employees down back to like around under 20 uh, over the course of a couple of months. I laid myself off and most of the executive team and the founder hibernated it. Now it's like incredible. Like it's on a pretty clear IPO track. It's got a, uh, about a thousand employees now and it's roaring back. But at the time, man, like it was in t- the entire revenue stream went from a couple tens of millions to zero. It's character building. <laughs> yeah. And I guess just so people understand the context, it's you have to, you're, you guys were kind of like, I don't know, building, renting, retrofitting, pretty big spaces. They were basically big green rooms, right? Yeah, exactly. Like imagine you, know, you go to a mall and it's basically kind of, you're putting four motion capture stages or two to four inside a mall space and you're going to walk in, right? Um, and that was part of the appeal for me, joining Sandbox. Um, I joined Postmates because I thought it was interesting to be able to move atoms, having only done digital products. And I joined, one of the reasons I joined Sandbox is like, I figure with my background, very few people would have the experience of operating and starting retail businesses. I just thought that was like a fun, eclectic thing to do. I don't know what I was going to do with it. But yeah, it was very much a retail business. Yeah. And it, it's probably interesting timing with, if I'm remembering, that was like the peak of the death of malls. So I'm sure the real estate was relatively affordable-ish, or at least, you know, there's no demand for these emptying, dying malls. And you're like, hey, we're going to build a destination experience in the mall. And it's in person. I mean, I'm sure that's, it made the economics kind of interesting, just in the sense of the real estate was probably pretty affordable, relatively. Yeah. Actually, what's really, I I learned a lot and it was really eye-opening about real estate. So there's like two things that are really surprising. So One thing is the real estate is affordable if you understand the incentives of the owner, which is that we're actually an attraction, right? We attract real estate. People pre-book. We don't rely on foot traffic. 
And so that ends up being one of the reasons why real estate is a lot more affordable. And the second thing is we basically like for most of our locations, we pay next to no rent and landlords pay to construct the stores. And so it's a surprisingly capital efficient business once you have a little bit of traction. Just because you bring so much traffic to the mall? Correct. Wow. That's wild. That's unexpected. I mean, I guess that's why you had so many people interested in the Series B too. Once you look in our hood as a surprising, like lucrative business. Interesting. So I had one, one actual last question on Sandbox from Neve Drawer at Shrug. One, I think he was a Sandbox investor, also a runway investor, if I'm remembering. Yeah. So he said, I got to ask you, there was a time you played Sandbox VR with Kanye. This is after Andreessen invested in the A. And uh, Ben Horowitz is like best friends with Kanye. And Kanye was in town. And we had this one store at Hillsdale. And Ben emailed and said, hey, Kanye, you want to play with Kanye? Kanye wants to try it. I said, okay, yeah, let's do it. So this was like five years ago. This is like older Kanye. It was 2019. Around there. Hillsdale is LA, right? Yeah, that's right. So if you're familiar with the Hillsdale Mall, there's just like one restaurant, like I think Paul Martini's, I think it's called. And they have this patio. And we're supposed to meet at 10. And I think I got there like a couple of minutes late. Um, and they were Ben and Kanye were in the patio hanging out, having a drink in the morning on Saturday. And I walk up to the reception of the restaurant. And I said the coolest words that ever came out of my mouth, like up to that point and to this day. I said, I'm with Kanye. And the reception woman was like, right away, sir. And they walled off this, they, they roped off this area in the patio and Kanye was just like on his phone being Kanye. Ben was like eating some salad and I was just looking at it um, waiting for him to finish his call. Uh, he wasn't especially talkative. And we met again and I have a different Kanye story, but it was the first time. And so a few minutes later, we leave this restaurant and we need to walk towards a store so we need to go outside go through the mall and enter our like small store and the entourage was like a dozen people like between his people and his bodyguards and i just remember walking through the mall next to him and these kids would walk by and just do like this is a random mall like you know it's not even popular and there's kanye west and they're like oh they and so they're getting out their phones by the time we walked up 150-ish, 200-meter distance to the mall, there was already, like, a crowd of kids following him. And a few minutes later, like, all their kids are in Santa telling their friends, and, like, kids were driving in, and the people were peering into the window front of the store, uh, and Kanye played a thing. And the other thing I'll remember about Kanye is that he's one of the two people uh, who has played Deadwood Mansion, which is our first title. It's a very scary sort of zombie experience. I think you've done it. Um, you've done Sandbox. And... He was completely unreactive to it, like just undisturbed. Like everyone who plays it, they're freaking out, they're running, they're like, ah, and he's just like walking, like unreactive to it. And I was like, wow, this guy is wired different. Yeah. Maybe he just played a lot of Call of Duty. Yeah. I was like, does he even like it? And he took it off. He's like, this is great. And we had a whole conversation about the best day and they came back down in LA and we had another, another meeting where he tried some new stuff. Interesting. Yeah. He was probably just dissecting the the product, like the art. He was probably just so focused on observing. Yeah. So the other only other person had the had a reaction was Michael Obitz. And Michael Obitz is like pretty old and we thought he would get a heart attack. We were like skip concerned for his health. And he was in there and he was also completely not reactive. He was looking at the thing and when he was done, he took out the headset and he went through like, here's a story arc, here's where it could be improved, here's like the, the the setup of the scene and I was just blown away. You know, these two people are wired so different. Yeah, they were probably just completely dialed in to just like the experience that they they were so immersed in it that they were studying it and didn't react because they were just so focused on observing it and just living it, soaking it in. So then, I mean, it's a really interesting transition then into runway. You talked about you had to figure out what happens when COVID hit. That was kind of like when you came up with the idea for Runway. Can you just kind of talk through that a little bit? When COVID hit, one of the things we needed how to do is Andreessen was triaging all of their portfolio companies for COVID impact. 
So they were Messer Line Bike, us, a bunch of other companies too. And everyone was going back to their insider investors trying to get into Fusion because everyone was distressed and no one was about to invest in some other company. So we had to scenario plan for what we're going to do, how we're going to survive through COVID if it lasts for three months, six months, 12 months, two years. Remember in June, or was it in April, Elon tweeted that this is all going to be over by June. I remember that, yes. He got a lot of heat. And Elon's like, yeah, you guys are, I'm, I'm really smart. Turns out, not so much on that topic. <laughs> Classic Elon, just, you know, he's confident in what he says. And Andreessen, on the other hand, I remember, if you remember in January, they put up these like signs on the door and got me fun up for saying we don't shake hands anymore. I remember that, yeah. That was early too. That was like February or something. January, late January, I was there. Yeah, they were really early and they got made fun of for that. And I remember when we were doing the scenario planning and working with the firm, they said, "This is we believe it's going to be two years. And nobody believed that at the time. And they were spot on. And so it's one of those things I think about when I think about like what makes different firms like so great, like things like that. They're, they're, and Naval has a saying, truth is that which has predictive power. Right. And they predicted it correctly. And they were one of the old few people in the world to have done that. We had to create these scenarios for how long COVID is going to last and, you know, like what the financial plan is. I just remember doing that on Google Sheets. I remember working with our CFO, emailing these Google Sheets back and forth. And there were errors. It was slow. It was confusing. It was really frustrating. Long story short, uh, we had to lay off pretty much everyone, hibernate it, and do what we can to preserve capital and get some capital to survive. And we basically had to get it down to like no one. So that's what we did. And I laid myself off along with the rest of the executive team. But half an hour later, I was having a conversation with our new layoff CFO, okay, from Netflix. And I asked him, hey, this scenario planning for COVID, we could have used something different from that, right? You know, Notion and Figma are all products exist. There was something that is already there. I just haven't heard of, right? This, someone must have solved this problem. And he said, no, like, it, this is the best we've got is pretty much a sheets and it's not great. Uh, or there's really expensive software like Anaplan, but everyone has used it using it too. Uh, and I thought, this seems like something interesting to build. I mean, that's how Rome we got started. Interesting. Yeah. So why didn't it exist before 2020 when you started it? Like, you see the only options were sheets and maybe Excel? Sheets, Excel... And that's it. That's the state of R, really. And Excel and Sheets are like fantastic pieces of software. Like they can do anything, right? It's like the kind of the gold standard of this. And I think the more we get into this, into the, the, the development runway, the more we realize that there is like deep structural reasons for why this doesn't exist. And so one of them is technology, right? Like the existence of Notion and Figma and Airtable are like fairly recent phenomena. Right. So that's one. And two is I do have this idea that there is like this vast financial conspiracy where these tools are so awful. And part of the conspiracy is that these products are so terrible that you pay somebody who is willing to use it. And I'm getting paid because I'm the person who knows and is willing to use this piece of shit. And so those are like really powerful incentives. So I think that's like one of the reasons why that is the case, along with the advancement of both what is possible in technology and design. This other factor too, though, is the changing strength of transparency and in organizations. So we've seen this story before. So if you think about what the world was like, for example, before Amplitude, to get data for retention and growth, you had to go through the data team, right? And not everyone had access to it. And so it was considered like somewhat sensitive in a lot of organizations, like what user accounts or where attention was, right? And the existence of amplitude and tools like that democratize access to people who aren't data analysts, who aren't part of the data team. You're a product person, business person, engineer. You can get the answers yourself. And now we kind of take it for granted that you can work at a company, you kind of just understand the, the, the metrics of the product. That wasn't always the case uh, because the tool wasn't there. And Figma is actually a similar story. People think of Figma and they think it's a really great design tool in a browser, 
But we forget that before Figma, it was considered impolite to even look over the shoulder of your designer when you're designing, right? Like when you're a designer and like a person walks over and you're looking over your shoulder, it's like kind of a faux pas. But now everyone is in Figma together and they're collaborating. It's made design more strategic in the same way it's made data more strategic in the form of amplitude. There is no such equivalent for the business itself. And the thing about finance that I think is really misunderstood and the opportunity is that finance is not about like bean counting or the spreadsheet that no one really understands. It is actually about the entire thing. It is about the entire business. What this spreadsheet is, is a software simulation of a business. It's coded in Excel language. It simulates a future and you use it so that you can understand the impact of the decisions that you make today in the future, which means that for it to be accurate, it has to take into account accurately how every department works, how the product works, how marketing works, how sales works, and have connect to all the data sources and people need to have a stake in it. And none of that is true today in these models. And so, you know, because the expectations for transparency and the competitive advantage that companies have when people collaborate and get insights from people on the ground on what should be done and the advantage of having everyone understand the context of where you're going, you need something that's more accessible and that has never existed. But that's like a relatively recent shift that I think has crossed a critical point over the past few years. Uh, and now everyone understands and everyone Mark is like, oh, we need to like have something accessible and we need to collaborate. But to do that, you need to have a very different product. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting point where you say, you know, d- design, super important, impacts the product, marketing, you know, growth impacts how big the company is, et cetera, engineering, you're building the product. But all these things tie into the number. Like when you say we need to grow faster, it's because you need the spreadsheet to go up. When someone says we need to design a new product, we need new product lines, like it's because that flows into the spreadsheet that then values the business at the end of the day. Like, there's a very qualitative piece of like, we're going to design something new, but then there's a quantitative of like, it has some kind of value at the end of the day. So it's a, it's an interesting point. And then when you were talking, it kind of made me think of, okay, when was the spreadsheet invented? When was Excel invented? It was invented in, I actually don't know, like the 70s, 80s? 78 multi-plan, I think. There's like, there was a killer app for the first personal computer. So right around then. Really? And, and this was pre-internet. So the spreadsheet was designed before you could collaborate. Like computers were not connected to each other. That's right. It was like the very first killer app for the personal computer. Yeah. And then when I think of what was Sheets, like that was the first kind of internet native. I mean, there's probably other ones, but it's the, the biggest internet native spreadsheet, but it was just taken. It had to be compatible with Excel and like with offline spreadsheets really at the end of the day. So it's the same thing. Really hasn't changed. And what are we at? 48, 46 years. And maybe I can't remember the number you said, but anyways, been like almost 50 years of like the same thing, basically. Yeah. And I think that's like a positive in many ways, right? And it's like an accessible interface. People can quickly pick it up and understand the basics of it. And they even have to change it. Like there's, they've added a lot on top of it. And so I think that's great. The issue is that because it's so powerful, because this product can do anything, it can do any specific thing super well. And that's the opportunity. So, you know, one really simple example is you think about like what is required for people to collaborate on a model for the company, right? And why it doesn't happen. And the reasons are actually like really simple. So let's say I have a company model and I want to be able to share the context of this model with my head of sales or a head of product. I actually can't do it. And the reason why I can't just share the model is because this model has everyone's salary in it. And on a spreadsheet, you can't just say, show everything but hide this one column. That's not a feature that exists in any Excel or Sheets product. And so the observation here is that it can do anything, but it can do any specific thing well. And there are many use cases that are very specific things. Like business planning is, turns out to be a pretty specific thing. Airtable unbundled Excel for a pretty specific use case, which is like the database use case. And you can do a lot more that you can't do in Excel as easily. Um, and so that's sort of our observation is that like, if you think about what the use case is, the abstractions required are different to make it really accessible and useful. And that informs our product strategy at Runway in a pretty fundamental way. 
Yeah, you have a pretty fun LinkedIn description of what you're doing at Runway. It's disrupting the $80 trillion business industry. I mean, that's just like global GDP, basically. You're just like changing the way businesses run, essentially. That is the ambition here. The mission of Runway is to make business accessible and understandable to everyone. And this is a really personal and important mission, I think. It's personal to me because I've always felt insecure about being any kind of business person. I have a technical background, right? Like, I don't know what this finance stuff was, even when I was CEO. And I wanted to understand it better. But I think like on a broader level, this is not a product designed for any one industry. Like really think about it in terms of like people and actually adding meaning to their work. So the two things that make the mission important is from an enterprise perspective, we believe that if you have more people in your company who understand how the business works and can contribute to the running of the business and contribute to insights, you will make better decisions. And if you have a tool that people understand the how the business works and understand the plans, it's easier to align everyone to go in the same direction, right? So one of the things I talk about when we talk to candidates, for example, is have you ever experienced like someone high up making what seems like a really dumb decision, right? The pointy hair boss doing something dumb. And everyone has some version of this. And my observation here is that half the time they are really stupid. There's a lot of stupid leaders, but half the time it's probably because they know something that you don't. And had you known it, it would have made complete sense, right? You're saying as a, as a lower level, judging the dumbness of a higher ups decision. Right. You have some context that you don't have, which is why the context over control value at Netflix is so powerful. Like if people know the same things and they have good judgment, chances are people will at least understand and find reasonable where you're going and maybe move in the same direction. Um, and so understanding how the business works and what the trade-offs are helps you do that too. It helps you align on the right decisions and make better decisions. But then from a personal, like just working experience standpoint, whether you're an engineer or PM, we know what makes work fulfilling and fun is autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And we kind of pretend that it's you can have purpose without needing to understand how the business works or the context around it. And the image I have of this is basically you are chickens in a farmhouse and you're getting fed every day in the form of massages and high salaries. And one day, Farmer John takes a bunch of chickens out and cuts her head off. Because you did not understand that you live on a farm. And that's what it is when you don't understand what the business is and how it's doing. You get laid off one day and you're like, what happened? I thought everyone's getting massages and things are great. But that shouldn't be how it works. Yes, you're really just opening up more visibility into the business. Helping people understand the company that they're a part of, that they're contributing to at the end of the day. So you have two things that really stood out to me in terms of how you build it. There's automation that's like built in. And then you say the formulas are 50 times easier than Excel. What do those two things mean? Because that sounds like pretty big if you can pull them off. Yeah. Well, think about how you write a formula in Excel, right? Like let's say you have a runway in some naive way. Like you, you divide bank account by your burn of the spot. <laughs> yep. But like, that's fine. You can do that, right? But like, what is the formula? The formula is like A1 divided by B1 or, you know, like A2 divided by B2. Yeah, those are hard to audit if you're going in. What does that mean, right? And this is where the abstractions make a difference and the primitives make a difference. So the core primitive in Excel is a cell. That's why it's called Excel, right? And so you put a formula in one cell, you paste it across and like it does some smart transformations and the, the formula reference cells, right? So think about what happens though. The way runway works, for example, is our core abstraction is one of the core abstractions is a row. And with a row, you can give it a name. So you have a row called cash and you can just name it. You can create another row called bird and you can just name it and you can create a formula there. And the formula for runway then is cash to buy back. You know, it's one formula and that one formula is goes across the entire row, right? And so you could have a hundred rows, but it's still one formula. And because it's easy to read, because it's semantic, it's easier to debug, uh, it's easier to understand. So it's basically just giving the people the ability to name the rows and the columns makes it so much simpler to use and understand. 
Yeah, that's one of the things, right? I think like we have other ideas here. And so we think about the concept of abstractions a lot. So abstractions and the right abstractions make things easier to understand and enable new workflows. So for example, the probably the, our most powerful abstraction is this idea of plans. So imagine like you're doing a growth model, right? And you have a row called conversion rate. And maybe you know that in your product roadmap, your conversion rate from registration, installed registration goes from 50% to 55%, 60%, right? On the spreadsheet, what does it look like? You have a row called conversion and you have one cell that's 50, another cell that's 55, another cell 60, right? But how do you as a product person actually think about what you're doing? You think about it in terms of product roadmap and you think about the features that you're going to build to make that happen. They have a certain time, they have a name, they have an owner, that context is completely disconnected from those numbers, right? So we have a concept called plans. And basically it's, it lets you say, hey, the reason why this change from 55 to 60% is because we're gonna work on this feature at this time by this person, and here's what we seem to happen. And now that you have these plans, you can just like drag the plan on a timeline. You can say, okay, this is what happens when it happens in Q3 instead of Q2. And the numbers would just like work and stay in sync with the spreadsheet. Or you can just like drag the impact up and down. It's like, well, what happens if the conversion rate of this feature goes from 55 to 70%? And when you make those changes, we have another abstraction called a pull request, which is for by GitHub, right? Right now, if you make a change, you make an entire copy of it. But with pull requests, you could say, here's a change we're proposing to the plan. You have a conversation about it. And so all of these things are things that you can't do with if you just have a cell and you don't have like new abstractions that make it easier to understand. So then I know you have a bunch of integration. So are you integrating with, I, I'm just kind of trying to come up with an example, like you're integrating with Asana for some of the product roadmap stuff. Is, is that kind of how that works? So if like I am in Asana, I'm changing my plan or whatever I'm using for my roadmapping, you know, I change when this thing gets released, it flows into runway and it impacts what I'm seeing from the quote unquote spreadsheet finance perspective. Yeah, you could do that. People actually just try to connect their plans directly. Yeah, you can people integrate everything, right? They integrate Jira, they integrate like the CRM. And so everything that you use really to run a business eventually falls down to the bottom line somewhere and is a central area for a row integrate. And that's not what happens today in software because finance is like siloed. Like you'd basically integrate with your like general ledger, you know, your accounting system. Then that's about it. I majored in accounting. I freaking hate accounting. Yeah, but it should integrate with your analytics system, right? Like a change retention and growth. It should integrate with your marketing system. And you should see the changes in real time. And that's not how it works. Let's say, you know, you're trying to sell runway. You've got to sell it to a CFO, a finance team. They're used to Excel. Maybe they use Sheets. What's the pitch usually? How does that go convincing them to use this whole new type of paradigm of finance software? You know, what's funny is like we actually try to not have to do any convincing. And this is somewhat of a surprise to us is that it's not a vitamin. It's, it's very much a painkiller. And when you are on Excel at a certain scale of company, you experience very serious pain. And the pain come, comes in roughly three forms. The first one is the raw amount of time it takes to update your model as new data comes in because it has to take into account all these different things. What you have to do every month is pull in a bunch of data from your data warehouse, from your general ledger, from your CRM. And that just sucks to do. You probably have a couple tabs that are like data dump and data cleaning, cleansing tabs with formulas and like macros probably. Exactly. And that only gets worse over time. You only never have less data, right? You only have more data sources over time. So that's the first thing that happens. The second thing that happens is the company gets to a size where you need to collaborate between different departments, understand what people's plans and goals are. And today, the way you finance people actually do it is they create these empty spreadsheet templates. And as a department of building, I got this, right? Like you, I, I get one of these and it's like, can you tell me how much you're going to spend and how much we're going to make? And it's just like pure paperwork because I don't know what it's for. I don't know where it's going. I don't know why you use it. And so collaboration becomes a pain. And so something that helps people understand like, okay, what are you going to do and how does it affect the business? And we like collaborating in a reasonable way becomes increasingly painful and needed. And the third thing is the business itself just becomes way too complex. You have multiple entities across multiple countries. You have multiple customer segments. You have millions of SKUs in, in, in some cases. At some point, 
the sheer complexity of it makes it so that Excel can't handle it anymore. And so all of these forces are pushing for someone to go to something different. The problem is your choices in the market today is basically keep on dealing with the pain or go to this other thing that actually doesn't solve your problem that everyone uses that creates a whole nother kind of pain, which is like the established Anna plans and enterprise products of the world. And the funny story is like, I talked to a Fortune 100 CEO one time and they used Anaplan. And we talked to a lot of users of Anaplan and everyone said it's the worst a thing because it's really difficult to model with. And he said, it was great. Like it did exactly what I was hoping to do. And I'll introduce a person who like set it up for us. Maybe they got it right. And we talked to that person. It's like, no, it was awful. Like you have no idea. That dude had no idea how much time and pain it was to set this up and like have other remarks. What is he talking about? I was like, okay, that, that squares. And is it usually like there's just like someone on the team that just uh, like eats the shit sandwich, just like they got to own this thing and like th- that's their job. Yeah, I, I think that it's sort of the underrated another going back to your question about why it's bad. When you're a certain size, you can just hire people to use the software. And like the, that's the incentive and it makes sense. And but because what that hides is the opportunity cost of having something that people truly want to use and can use the insights and the efficiency gains you gain from that, you can't really measure, but they're present. Everything we've just talked about, I know that it took a while to kind of get through this. Like it wasn't like this just like clicked right away. So kind of, I guess going back like runway fundraising, you raise that first round kind of after COVID. How do you fundraise? Like what, take us inside. Like you've obviously done it a bunch of times. I think you're pretty experienced at it. How do you approach fundraising? What are kind of best practices and what do you do that's maybe a little bit different? There's two parts of fundraising. One is process. The other part is the pitch. And the pitch is on the long story. In terms of process, you treat it as any other like sales process, right? You want to have a pipeline. You want to have as many meetings as possible in a concentrated period of time. So the thing that's different about fundraising and sales is that it's, there's a business transaction uh, that is has a market clearing price. And so if you think about in those terms, then you want to minimize your supply and maximize your demand to maximize the price, the clearing price. And so the things, the thing about minimizing supply is imagine you're looking to two companies. One company says, we're raising five on 10. We're halfway there. The other company says, we're raising two and a half million and we're already subscribed on 10. Exact same situation. Another one just sounds better. So limiting your supply is like one way of increasing effective demand. The, the other one on the demand side is imagine you have access to like 12 VCs in the world. You know, that's your entire network. There's a huge difference in having those meetings over the course of three days versus like a year, right? Like the co- concentrating your finite demand in time is a very useful technique and maximize your demand. And you need to create heat in order to close a round. One of the truths about fundraising is that rounds will either be oversubscribed or they will never close. And that is totally true. And so whatever you can do to minimize your supply and maximize your demand is very helpful. So that's on the process side. I have this process where I try to trunch my meetings in three tranches. So there is the first tranche is people who are going to invest no matter what. And these are Fed leads. I get feedback on it. I get some momentum into the round. Those are the first. Yeah, that's the first tranche, right? And by the time I get to the second tranche, which is like people I don't know, but also people I don't particularly care about, I have a bit more feedback into the pitch and under some momentum into the round already. So you might get some conversions in that, that wave. Right. And the third tranche is like people you actually really want. At that point, you have all the momentum. Maybe you have term sheets and your pitches well, well practice. The way in which you polish your pitch during that process, one of the most common founder questions or complaints is that I thought we had a great pitch and they didn't tell me why. They just kind of ghosted and I don't know what the issue was, right? And the hack is they always do tell you why they're not investing if you know how to listen for it. And the reason why they're not investing is the first question that they ask. Whatever that question is, that's what we were thinking about while you were talking and that's the objection. And so the algorithm is how do you update your pitch the next time so that that question doesn't even come out in the first place so the question is like how do you think about competition the, they're probably thinking this entire time in credit competitive space i don't know if i want to invest so if you add a slide which i literally have done this before the next thing saying very competitive space here's why it still makes sense question will come up uh, and this has happened so that's like the first part of the process the second part of the story and the two frameworks here is one, how do people actually make decisions? It's not based on facts. It's based on motion. Like, so the question, for example, it's, it ends up being a really good filter for, for example, one of the frequent questions you have is like, what should I put in the deck? What should I put in the index? 
And the thing you put in your deck is like things, whatever gets people to feel something. And the thing that you want them to feel is eventually leads to greed. Like I'm going to make money on this. Yeah. Yeah. The particular emotional journey I, I like to take people on, by the way, is go from amusement to curiosity to surprise to awe to greed. And so I try to create a story that will generate those emotions. So amusement will tell you that, hey, if you decide to not invest and learn nothing here, at least you won't be bored. And so you can pay attention. Curiosity then suggests that you might learn something. And surprise is like, oh, that paid off. I did learn something interesting. The odd then goes, this interesting thing could be extremely valuable. In fact, could be one of the most valuable companies in the world. Yeah. How do I get in? Yeah. How do I get in? Exactly. The other framework about a story is if you break down an investor rationally, you can break it down in terms of one, likelihood of success. And two is size of the outcome they're successful. The thing that dominates the decision, I think is the second term, the size of the outcome is, is successful. And not enough stories and pitches focus on that because that's the nature of venture math, right? Like you want to be able to believe that this company could be a Stripe or an Airbnb or whatever one day. And so much of the issue with the founder psychology is that because founders have to be in the ground day to day, they're we're so focused on now to execute, that's hard for us to transition and context shift to what you're what are you actually selling you're not selling today what people are buying is tomorrow and people are don't spend enough time talking about that is there a similar thinking then on the recruiting side the story that you tell like is it what are the differences between fundraising storytelling and then maybe recruiting and customer storytelling like how do you think about making that transition yeah, yeah this is actually a relatively new insight but i think is something that I think is super impactful in how I think about operating and for runway. So the role of the story, right? And we have a fundraising story. We have a recruiting story. We have a marketing story. We have an internal story, right? And the default is to think about these as independent, as like things that you do outside of the product, right? You build products, all these customer problems, and we need to figure out what a marketing story is. And then we're recruiting. We need to figure out like what the recruiting story is. And I think the thing that I've realized talking to a bunch of advisors and working on our story is that it's so powerful to think about the story as just like one thing and everything flows from that story. And that story is like, why do you exist as a company? What is the purpose and mission of this, right? This comes out to mission and vision. And the, the thing about that mission, vision, culture, and values, the thing about that is people also think about those things as sort of like these independent things that you kind of do. You check out the box, right? But all of that is just one thing. The story of Runway is that we believe people should understand the nature of their work. They should, this should be accessible to people that has profound implications on what it feels like to be working and how it impacts the, the success of businesses. And that's why we exist. And to do this well, we have to both, we have to connect the art of product development, but also the nature of being human and being a, having emotions and the squishiness of it with the hard-nosed numbers and machine that is a business. We have to like connect the two. And so that informs the story that we tell to investors, to candidates, what product we build, how we communicate what we do to the market. It's all one thing. And so I think Lulu Chung had a really great article on Pirate Wires about like Anduril and how they do comms. And I think about it in similar ways. There was this picture of the story should be the center. It starts with the founder. And then you expand that circle to the leadership team, then to the wider team, then to your customers and to the world. If you can do that, and that's how your story is, it's one story and it impacts everything and is actually the central axis by which your company operates. And I think I didn't think about story in that vein, in that way until fairly recently, but it's been so powerful. Yeah. And it's almost like it can mean different things to different people. Like the story that you're telling means something to you, to a, to an employee, to an investor, to a customer. Like a customer might be like, cool, better software. For you, it's like changing the world. To an employee, it's like, this is a fun place to work. I really enjoy what I'm doing. Feel like I'm getting value to an investor. It's like we're going to make money, and that story that you're telling 
it's it's the same story, but it means something different to different people depending on where they're at in that uh, that circle that's expanding out. You want it at the deepest level to be the same story because if it's not the same story, you it won't be cohesive, right? The culture, the team, the people in it that you hire, the marketing that you do with the product and your brand, it won't mesh. It won't make sense. But if it's the same story with different facets of expression, there's like something deeply cohesive and powerful and weighty that we've seen really powerful results here in Runway. So you have this really interesting framework around positioning to yourself, your company, your business. Can you talk through that? So this is something I learned from a person named Wolfgang Hammer, who was the producer of House of Cards. And he ran Cinemax and uh, CBS. And we've been working on positioning a story for Runway. And there's this framework that he had about good stories that really stuck with me. And this idea that a great story has three layers. The first layer is action, like the events of the story, right? That's the most surface uh, level of layers. The next layer deep is emotion, how people feel during the story and people are picking that up. But what makes the story deep and interesting and profound is the deepest layer. And the deepest layer is really you. And this really blew my mind. And this idea that what makes an interesting story is a conflict of worldviews between a dominant, like default worldview and an underdog worldview. And so the global worldview is something that is mainstream, everyone believes. And critically, there's like really good reasons for why people believe that and why it's a dominant. So in our case, as an example, you know, finance is supposed to be complicated and you like, you know, Excel is great and all these things, right? And there's great reasons for why that is true. And the underdog worldview is a different worldview. You can imagine a better world and there are like untruths about the reasons for why the dominant worldview is correct. And uh, it's a personal story. The thing that really struck me about that is that in stories, the dominant worldview is held by the antagonist of the story. And the protagonist story is always an underdog worldview. And so like when I think about positioning, like like that's been such a hell of a framework thinking about like what is a like the enemy worldview that you're fighting against? Because the counter to that and what makes you different and how you're positioned is going to be the underdog worldview. And weaving that in into the story is how you get to like a really good position or narrative about how you sit in the world and how to get people to feel something and follow you and all these other great things. Yeah, it almost ties back to this concept of just like counter positioning. It's like, what's the incumbent startup business, whatever you're competing against? And then what do I believe that's different that's actually maybe better or maybe, maybe it's just different and figure out if it's better. Not all startup ideas work, but yeah, that's an interesting framing to think of it. I like that. Yeah, and and one of the critical things is like how reasonable and how seductive the default the reason supporting the default world is and it's so important that you understand deeply those reasons right it's almost like you know the eight in eight mile you're like doing a accusation audit right of the global war viewers like here is like all the reasons why you this is actually great and i get it but there's a lie here and not everyone can see the lie or is brave enough to call it out but this is what we believe that's different. And people are blind to that. And it's probably most helpful if it's like a very simple solution, yours of like, it's so believable and it's so easy to just, it's like something that people overlooked almost, where it's like, hey, if we just do this one thing differently, all parties benefit, all stakeholders, it's actually better for everyone. So a, a little bit of a related question to story and how that impacts the team question that came up from, this is from Kevin Lee, mutual friend. I think Arjun Sadi also had the same question. Just how have you cracked org design, like organizing the team? Kevin specifically said, you figured out how to make remote work work was his, was his comment. How do you do it? How you, how do you think about it and what's working for you? I really don't feel like we've done that. That's nice of him to say, but we're trying to figure it out as much as anyone. I mean, the background is we were founded right when COVID started. We had no choice. So we tried to make the best of it. We tried like does like just about every remote work tool there is. And we even like tried a hardware company to have a remote tool where you can like kind of 
have this like iPad on the side and click on a face and just start talking to them as if like they were next to you. And nothing really worked, I think. Right now we do just normal things. We use Notion and Zoom and Slack and Heights um, mostly. The way in which we've made it work better is one, we just have more practice at it. Two is we're closer to product and market fit and the ambiguity is lower than it was before. But probably the most important thing is like we just get together regularly in person. So twice a year we have an offsite, you know, we get together and in between those offsites, we do an onsite, which is like we just get together in the same place and just do normal work. So we did one three weeks ago. It's my favorite working experience ever. And I guess the way we made it work is like there's somewhat of a balance. Like we do have hubs in New York and SF and people come in usually twice a week and I do as well. And I think like the way in which we made it work is I think we've tried to not be religious about any particular thing. Like some work is done better alone at home. Some work is done better together. And for people who want to work differently, we give you the option. And instead of like, focusing on particular form and prescription for such a work because reality is like whether it's remote work or any other best practice the opposite of, of the best practice also works what you have to manage to is results and if people aren't effective remotely or however they choose to work then we manage them out and that's the thing that really is a thing that makes it work is that like we try to hire people who are effective at how how they work and we try to not be religious and prescriptive about how any one person chooses to work. So how do you make a good hire then? It sounds like it's super important for you guys. What's your process? We've evolved. We started with writing samples and a work trial early on. And I think a lot of companies have kept on doing that. Uh, We found that it was difficult to scale in the sense that it really selected for people who didn't, who are really available or didn't have kids or was able to take a lot of time off. And that's not usually everyone. So I observed that Lenny did a series on this recently, but like the question was not asked about what are people with, with kids and family who can't take time off like that and do a full long work trial or like aren't in between jobs. Right. And I think that's the real reason why we stopped doing it. Um, I think we've made better hires than we've ever had the past couple of months. So to give you a sampling, like our last two engineering hires were both VP of engineering, uh, VP of engineering at 500 million companies. And there's like IC engineers here. Our PMM is was a VP marketing and flex board. And so these are like fairly recent hires. So I think our ability to hire people has never been better. Our process is we do a take-home exercise. If that goes well, we do an on-site that's virtual. There's architecture, there's coding, there's a culture interview with me. And my interview really is just like, what's your story? It's actually literally just one question. Really? And you just, they talk. They just talk and I'm just listening. And what I'm looking for explicitly is we have some values at runway, give a shit, build trust, create clarity, raise the bar. And that's primarily the way in which we value way people. Does, does this person create clarity? Like, is the explanation clear? Does this person give a shit about their work and also what we do and why we do it? Right? Like we want people to actually like people, the thing about runway, man, like, I have been on such a high working here. And one of the things that I think about a lot in just like two weeks ago at all hands, one of my engineers expressed that on Sundays, he can't wait for Monday to arrive. Like can't wait for Mondays. Like he just, and every person in runway feels this way. And they're so gratifying. And it's because, you know, everyone else here gives a shit. And you know, everyone here gives a shit about why we're here. And that's why it feels that way. So we look for that. And not everyone feels that way about what we do on our mission. And that's totally fine. Not everyone feels that way about work and what they do. And that's fine. But it's not for us. That's probably one of the more important bits. Like give a shit is literally the value. Create, build, build trust as well. Does the person like understand how to build trust? Is self-aware enough? Low ego enough to do that. And the final one is raise the bar. Does the person push us to be better? Is it better than our average person? Does it improve or multiply us in some way? Have they demonstrated that in the past? Um, and a lot of that is also affected by this idea of high agency. Do I have an internal locus of control? Am I, do I have control over my own outcomes? Because um, there's other 
really powerful framework that I have about like these feedback loops that are kind of invisible that are so impactful to life outcomes. So one of the feedback loops is this idea of agency. So if you are a person who, for example, when something bad happens, believes that it's because of external circumstances, you're probably right. And the next time something bad happens, it's going to be more confirmatory. And as this loop happens, you're going to be more deeply embedded in this idea that everything that has happened to me is because of external circumstances, right? Because everything that happens is additional confirmation. But if you do the opposite, the opposite loop happens too, right? If you believe something bad happens to you and you have control over it and you do something different, the next time something happens, you it confirms it. The next time something happens, it confirms it. And you like build on top of that and you get momentum that way. And so the people with the positive feedback cycles end up very, very different. And I think that's one of the best traits that's correlated with what we're looking for too. So it's people who are excited about what you're doing. They care. They give a shit. You can trust them. They make, they're very good at what they do. They improve the team. They make other people better. And they just keep getting better over time because they believe that they have control over that they can, they can improve. Yeah. That's an excellent summary. So like one of the things that I think a couple people mentioned on was like, it wasn't like you cracked this immediately. Like it kind of took you a while to go from the sandbox VR experience to then like where you're at today, like the current product is very polished. What was that journey like of going from like, okay, we know we have to fix this problem to it works or to a product that, that people want to use. It was personally torturous because the thesis behind people investing runway is that we're going to take a consumer founder, apply it to an enterprise area, and maybe something good will come out of that. <laughs> so that, okay. It's a good thesis, honestly. I think that's ended up being true. But I think what it ignored is how much you also need to unlearn because the nature of building enterprise products is highly different. The surface area is much wider. And understanding your customer and their pain points it is different like than building a consumer product. And so a lot of the pain in the first year and a half was just like unlearning and relearning and from the rest of the team, frankly, on like, how do you actually do this? And only after unlearning can I then apply what I am good at and reintegrate my superpowers. And so what were the things you had to unlearn? The thing about consumer a lot of time is like, you kind of just know what you build something for yourself and you know what you like and you put it out there see if other people like you to integrate from there. And the thing about enterprise is that people are really different from you. And you have to like, you can't just start by building something that you like because the segment of people who are actually have deeper pain that are valuable may be completely different from you. So that's like one. And two is if you just build what you like, the product outcomes of, of enterprise are actually path dependent. So what I mean by that is if I build something that I like and I'm like an early stage startup founder, say, then it's going to attract more early stage startup founders and you're going to get traction that way. And you're going to build more stuff for them. But if you haven't like really stepped back, I thought about like, talk to more people and thought about where is the real pain and with that pain, how much value is there? And are willing, are, and what is the willingness to pay around that? Then you might be led to build something for early stage startups for which there's high churn, low willingness to pay, and the pain frankly isn't that high. They're willing to use it because it's cool. Meanwhile, you have like a larger customer who's willing to pay thousands of dollars. I assume hundreds, hundreds of thousands. Yeah. Massive contract sizes, millions even. Yeah. And so the path dependency of it is something that is not uh, doesn't matter quite as much in consumer because you're by definition you're trying to attract like just about everyone right people with the phone can download the thing so that's really different one of the many things it was a skill like a superpower that you could build for like a consumer product but you almost built like you just had no experience on building for an enterprise customer to the point that you just kind of had to learn that skill while not losing that like consumery mindset, like the product experience, the thinking from first principles, redesigning, coming up, coming up with magic, I guess, if that's a fair way to think about it. Yeah. And the other part of this too, is that, you know, for the space that we chose, there is no obvious, like quick, easy wedge here because people rely on it to run their businesses, the core of their business. When you think about what is required to make that work, just to get off the ground, 
right? Like just get your foot in the door for someone to start using it. You basically have to build like a good chunk of Excel and then you have to build integrations with seven hundred hundred different things. And then you have to build a good chunk of Notion for reporting collaboration. And that's just to get your foot in the door. That's not even like, why should people choose your new thing over the thing that already exists? And that's hard because how do you even like get traction without having there's like the minimum so people like can actually use it for real? Um, and how do you like keep the team going when it's hard to get traction over, in our case, like many years? That was probably like the hardest thing to do, but you know, we still have problems and challenges like any every other company today, but it's not on nearly at the same scale as what it was a year or two years ago. You know, once you get that first paying customer and you have some kind of foothold, but getting to that first paying customer was, yeah, it was not fun. Yeah. How do you get through that? Like, what do you tell yourself as the founder and your team too? How do you keep people motivated? The story and mission helps this belief that this is not good enough and you could build something better. And that's just like somewhat blind optimism. The other story that I tell myself is, you know, when you look at the recent generation of truly great productivity enterprise type of products that are consumer grade, they all took three and a half to five years to launch. Figma, Notion, Airtable, Coda, even Anaplan back in the early 90s, that was a five-year journey to launch. And I think like there's not enough appreciation for like, if you want to build software of a certain kind, it actually takes a really long time. In the 18 month timelines that like Figma made no money, like didn't get to a million AR until I think it was like five years, six years in. It was like something between five and eight, I think it was. You pretty made the first million AR and then it exploded. So I think people forget or don't appreciate like how long this stuff takes. Um, and so looking at those benchmarks was helpful. Having Dylan feel as an investor and having him talk to the team was also quite helpful. Like what he said, I've thought about a lot and I've shared with the team multiple times. I asked him a question at an internal, you know, podcast, lunch and learn type of thing. And the question was taking Figma from where it was, which was nothing to where it, where it was today. What surprised you the most about that journey? And he said, what surprised me most is how few people, how few people made it all the way with us. I was like, that's interesting. But the more I thought about that, the more crazy that answer is. Because it's a team of smart people working on something cool. And what would it end up being is one of the most successful companies of all time. And half the people on that team look left and look right and said at some point, we're not going to make it. I don't believe it anymore. Like that's just a norm, right? That's like when it works out. Um, And so that's helpful. And the other bit that is helpful is basically I thought my job and the story I told myself is, trust me, guys, we're we're on a hockey stick growth curve. But when you plot out the hockey stick growth curve, we're just on a really flat part of the area. That's where we are. But we're going to get there. You know, you just got to like believe. And there was a lot of that for really good reason. Because think about it, like all their friends are working at OpenAI or Coinbase or somewhere and they're killing it. And meanwhile, your stinky startup has like no one using it. Wow. So it's really just believing in the mission, buying in, being in it for the long term and knowing the payoff when you actually build, finish the, the product and get it in people's hands that the payoff's going to be worth it. Yeah. Setting the right expectations, building momentum is something we think about a lot too. But sometimes like the activation energy is just really high for some classes of products. Well, awesome. This is a lot of fun. Thanks for taking the time to chat. This is I really a, wrote it. Yeah, this is a great conversation. Thank you so much for listening to this conversation with Siki Chen, co-founder and CEO of Runway. If you don't want to miss future episodes of The Peel, subscribe to my newsletter, The Split, in the show notes, and you'll get new episodes plus the transcripts in your inbox. If you want to support the show, share this episode with your friend who's head of finance and looking for a better tool to do their job. Thanks again to Siki for coming on, and thanks to you for listening. I hope you enjoyed. See you next episode.